Let's read the text together, and then I'll pray. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. This is God's precious, holy, inspired word. Let's pray. Our Father, now we seek to understand this passage and have our hearts and our affections turned towards you, and that the world, its evils, its lusts, our own sinful passions would be melted away as we peer into the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray, amen. Well, this passage really articulates, addresses our spiritual warfare within and our witness without. Here we're going to be introduced by Peter, very pastorally, our spiritual warfare within and our spiritual witness without. Over the past few weeks, we've looked at the verses prior that have been giving us this exalted status of the people of God. Who are we? In verse 9, we're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession who are going to proclaim his excellencies. This is glorious. This is wonderful. We're a holy nation, but we are not yet the only ones who exist. We are a holy nation in and amongst people who are not a holy nation. So how are we to function in a world that, according to this, is hostile to God? That everything that uh, people who are against God are doing and pushing towards and promoting does not bring honor to God? What, What do we do? How are we supposed to respond? And so this is a new section of the letter. He's going to talk about our role in the world. It goes all the way to chapter 3, verse 12, but here he dresses us. In terms of our passions, our desires, and our conduct, that fleshes out more specifically in three sections following, where we are looking at freed men in relationship to the government. How are we supposed to function in a government, maybe, that is against God, who has immoral policies, or maybe it's tyrannical? How should we be functioning? Then we see also he addresses slaves in relationship to their masters. And then following that, wives in relation to an unbelieving husband. And what we need to do in this section is put aside all that we know in these different spheres of what we bring to our understanding. Oh, I know how to relate to the government. Oh, I know how to relate if I was a slave to my master. Oh, I know how to relate to my unbelieving husband. And we need to say, wait a second, maybe I don't. I need to be taught by God's Word. So we come humbly to this portion of Scripture now, and we say, how are we supposed to live as God's holy nation in a world that's opposed to Him? So we get three exhortations here, which will be the focus and how we'll structure this talk. Ascertain your identity. Abstain from sin. And maintain good conduct. So three exhortations of how to function in this world. And as you boil it down, it's basically the exhortation is be in the world, not of the world, for the world. He doesn't pull us out of the world. So we're to be in the world, but not of the world. We're different. We're distinct. And yet here we see it's actually for the world. That means we have a purpose that this text addresses. So let's jump right in. First exhortation here is to ascertain your identity. We have a dual identity seen in this passage. The first comes out in this address. When Peter says, beloved, beloved, some of your translations might say dear friends. That's probably not most helpful because beloved is a passive word here that shows that you are actually loved by God. Yes, Peter also uses this to show that he loves them, but first and foremost, it is a 
a, a designation for the people of God who have been a chosen race. God has set his affection and love upon you. Now, beloved becomes an endearing term. You, the loved ones by God, whom I love as well. And so we take this and we say, all right, I'm listening. What does the God who loves me want to say? What does Peter, the apostle, who's commissioned by Christ to serve the church, what does he have to say? And here, using this most endearing term, beloved, he urges. And he's, it's almost like he knows what's coming, is so sensitive. It, it, it's so important. He says, beloved, I urge you. I urge you. We get this second facet of our identity, as he says here, that we are sojourners and exiles. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. Well, what is a sojourner? We've already addressed this idea before. Sojourner is someone who's passing through. They're not there permanently, so they're temporary residents. Then you have exiles. That language is of someone who's apart from their homeland. So they have a, a citizenship somewhere else. And we know that, according to 1 Peter, we have an inheritance that's kept in heaven for us. That means that's where we belong. In other places in the New Testament, we find that we are heavenly citizens. That we now on earth, even though we're in the heavenly places with Christ, we live according to that land's customs, laws, rules, affections, desires. And that then puts us at odds sometimes with the surrounding culture we're in. But he wants to remind them of this. Beloved, the ones loved by God, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, ascertain your identity. Do you understand you're the ones who are loved by God and yet in this world but not of the world? You're sojourners, you're strangers. That sets us up for what's to follow. What is the proper conduct for someone who is not part of this world, but at least for this point, let's think of this. If you are just going along your own merry way and kind of doing what everybody else does, following the culture, not critically thinking about maybe the practices, the habits, the way people spend their money, the time they designate to certain things, the functions, the way they organize their lives, maybe I should not be just sort of following the course of the world, Actually, I need to be intentionally trying to understand God's Word and set my life up accordingly. That is the exhortation here. You're a sojourner. You're an exile. You cannot just go with the current passive. Oh, they do that, so that's fine. Oh, I'm just looking at their family. They do it. It's okay. Wait a second. We need to have our ears and eyes open. Not everything that is acceptable in our culture is helpful, as we'll see here, for your soul. So, we look at things like what is currently acceptable, cars, videos, bathing suits, birth control, driving speeds, bedtimes, financial savings, education for children, unreached peoples, famine, all these things we're thinking about, sports, death, everything else we're taking into our mind, like, what does the culture think about everything? And now let's bring it to God's Word and see if, how we should organize our life. Now, the question I have for you this morning is, why are we still strangers and exiles? Why did God do this? Why did He leave us here? Could He not have taken us immediately to our homeland? Could He not have translated us or come back immediately and grabbed His people and go? No. He leaves us here. Why? Why? Why would he leave us here in a, in the time of First Peter was written, in a hostile environment where some of these people were probably beaten, mocked, some maybe killed, at least marginalized, experiencing suffering? Why does he do that? Well, he has a purpose. There is a purpose that comes about in this text that we will get to as well. But no matter what, we have a responsibility as strangers and exiles. That responsibility takes on two forms here. One is abstinence, and the other is maintenance. So, the second exhortation comes in the form of abstinence. Abstain from sin. That is our second exhortation of how we might function in a world that's hostile to God. Verse 11, 
Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Beloved, I urge you, listen, please listen to me. Abstain from the passions of the flesh because they wage war against your soul. I hope I have your ears here, okay? We've, had, we've seen glorious privileges and blessings in this text. You've been born again to a living hope. You have hope now. You are called to be holy. That means you can be holy. And you are to fear God because he's your father in heaven. He's the judge. And you've been ransomed with the precious blood of Christ. But I need to warn you. The passions of the flesh wage war against your soul. Well, what are these passions? Passions, really, the term is translated or could be translated desire. It could be used negatively or positively. It's basically those uh, natural desires that we have but can be corrupted when they are attached to something else. They're essentially neutral. Passion, desire, God gives these, these appetites for good, oftentimes for preservation. We have appetites to eat. We have appetites for the opposite sex so that the race might even be propagated. I mean, there's all these things that are neutral, but when they attach themselves to something, they become terrible. These desires are like fire. Many of us have fire in our houses. My, I have a gas grill. I have a gas stove. I have a gas water heater, furnace, all of it. There's a fire there uh, that helps warm the house, warm showers. Oh, there's so much blessing that comes from fire. Is that not true? We're thankful for it. It's great. But when the fire... It's not contained. When I have my little pilot light that kind of freaks me out because my gas stove, the pilot light, is always on. And when I go downstairs and I look in there and the lights are off, I'm seeing a little flame. I'm just like, that's ah, I'm a little uncomfortable with that. Everything's fine, though, if it's in its hearth, if it's contained. But when it jumps out, catches a curtain on fire, and then the wood catches, and then the entire house is completely in a blaze, destroyed. Fire is dangerous. Peter is saying, your desires, your passions are dangerous. He says they wage war on the soul. We have an example, Solomon from Proverbs. I always think that's fascinating. Solomon writes Proverbs. And yet he doesn't keep some of his Proverbs. Here we have in Proverbs chapter 6, Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he is hungry. But if he is caught, he will pay sevenfold. He will give all the goods of his house. But listen to this. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys his soul. These passions, these appetites, if not contained, grab a hold of what is called in the Bible uh, the works of the flesh. Sinful passions, adultery, immorality, greed, envy, anger, if not contained, they ruin us. Look into the imagery here. War. The passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. See, war, maybe our generation is a little too disconnected from war. We don't completely understand what this means when he's talking about war. That's why we watch these movies, Saving Private Ryan, Dunkirk, most recently in 1917, and my generation comes away as like, what? Because it's so, um, at least to my understanding, realistic. We're shaken by it. We are, we're like, did that really happen? You're in that movie, and uh, you, 
you're safe watching the movie, except maybe for a heart attack, but you can't help but feel like this is awful. It makes you sad. It makes you cringe. It makes you depressed that men are actually capable of this. What is it? What is war? It is destroy the enemy or be destroyed. This happens and shown, it's, it's, it's seen so perfectly in 1917 where uh, a, a man, a British soldier, uh, grabs a German enemy out of a burning plane to save him. For some reason, he's like, I'm going to show mercy to this one. I'm going to get him out. And he saves him only to minutes later then be killed by that soldier. Mercy is not suitable in war. It doesn't make sense because each side is trying to destroy one another. It is no different with these passions of the flesh that are at war with us. They are meant and are working towards your utter destruction. What Satan wants us to do is when we read this word, war, he wants to think of us to be thinking of video games. Oh, yeah, I'm just playing Call to Duty or something like that. This is not a big deal. But what Peter wants them to see is that your entire life is war. You can't let up for a minute. You're on guard. You're on duty. And sadly, what it often takes for us to see this and to take it seriously is to experience it. So we become lax, and then all of a sudden we fall into dreadful sin and we see its destruction. We see its deceptiveness. And we see the pain and the hurt and the dishonor it brings to God. So we see this war imagery in regards to Satan, that we are to put on the whole armor of God because we wage war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. But we also see it in this inward battle. James writes this, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Galatians chapter 5, walk by the Spirit, not the desires of the flesh, because the desires of the flesh are at war with the Spirit, are against the Spirit. Okay, I get that. Great, I get it. Oh, yeah, we should do that. Why don't we do it, though? Why are so many of us enraptured or caught up entangled in sin? Because sin is deceptive. It deceives us. According to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, Paul calls them deceitful desires. We have passions that left unchecked run amok. Sometimes we don't realize how wrapped up we are in it. I could think of Many discussions I've had with men particularly who uh, will be engaged in some sin pattern, and I will in some, some way or fashion say, hey, if you don't go at this, if you don't attack this sin with the same sort of intensity that Jesus talks about when you're ready to cut off your arm or pluck out your eye, then you're going to go to hell. And you know what happens? People will say, wait, what, is, what are you talking about? I, I'm a believer. You think I could lose my salvation? What is happening when that question comes out is that there's a disconnect between uh, the practical application of our salvation. When we are saved, God is now freed us from sin, and is conforming us into the image of Christ. 
What can happen is we take justification that we're right before God, declared righteous, and that means we can live however we want. I'm a believer. Once saved, always saved. But not realizing that Christ says this. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. What is he talking about there? If not saying, cut it off, you got to be done. That means you have the power to actually do it if you're a believer. You're enabled. And so, maybe that's just trying to shock people into the seriousness of sin, but what is Peter trying to say? Your flesh, your passions is out to destroy your soul. It needs to be taken seriously. So, what things... What things are waging war against your soul? We all have different propensities, different backgrounds, experiences. What is one man's difficulty is another man's cakewalk. But what is waging war against your soul today that maybe you've been like, "Eh, that's not too big of a deal? This is kind of a a little conflict I'm in with my flesh but we're going to sit down and have a little peace treaty and get it. No, this is out to destroy. What is it? Is it power? Is it control? Is it comfort? Is it security? Jesus expressed this rudimentary principle when he says this, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What he's doing there is uttering the calculus of economics, putting them on the scales hill here. Profit of man against the whole world, but his soul? Can you put a price tag on your soul? He goes on. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? This is the language of bartering. We've all seen the movies or the books when you have the little Satan or the little devil come up and say, hey, what will you give me for your your soul? You know, I'll give you this music ability, this talent, or whatever. This is this is this is what's happening here. Is there anything that you would want to exchange for your soul? If so, if you're tempted by something like this or not caring very much about your soul, you need to, for it is it is a most important matter in your life. Soul care. So he's very carefully, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, this is who you are, remember, you're set apart, you're a holy nation, now abstain from the passions of your flesh that are waging war against your soul. The Gentiles don't do that. The world, the system of evil that is against God, is made up of people giving into their own passions, their own sinful desires. You, on the other hand, are separate, distinct. So, ascertain your identity, who you are. This isn't your home. Abstain from sin. Being in the world, not of the world. And then third, maintain good conduct. Maintain good conduct, verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So, thinking of the Christian life and our relationship to the world... You can, you know, get a little unbalanced here. Abstain from the flesh in the world. So that means like just focus on holiness, being set apart. In fact, let's go and make up our own monastic communities or communes where we don't have to interact with the world. He's saying, no, 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 don't get that idea. Actually, keep your conduct honorable, that is abstaining from the passions of the flesh, And not just doing that, but doing good things so that the Gentiles whom you are among 
will actually see your good deeds and glorify God. So we got to, we got to try and look at this. First off, we see interesting language here that maybe caught your attention. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. What's that about? I thought this was a predominantly Gentile audience to which Peter is writing. Why does he use the term Gentiles? Some, that has led people to say, okay, this is actually just written to Jewish people, and so Jewish Christians, so Gentiles here. But we've already established that that's not the case. What he's doing is picking up again the, this Israel imagery in which God's people, his chosen race, the one whom he set his love upon, who were his prized possession, were distinct and separate from all the other nations. That is what Gentiles means. Here, continues on, he applies that to the church, Jew and Gentile, and says, now, keep your conduct among pagans, among those who don't believe, among those who are not God's people, honorable. That term, honorable, keep your conduct honorable, is beautiful, is what it's called, beautiful. It's not just good morally, it is beautiful conduct. To the, to the extent that somebody might, even somebody who's not a Christian would say, wow, that's, that's right, that's good. Honorable, it, it has a certain beauty to it. We still see this in our culture. I mean, you could, you could look at just what, what type of movies sometimes people really like. And the main person in that movie might be very honorable and like, wow, why does our culture really like this? This person does good. He treats people respectfully. He, he uh, sacrifices his own life. People like that still. They can still see it based, based on the fact that we're made in God's image. But not everybody is going to see that's beautiful. And so it says here, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, he's setting them up. Look, you are God's chosen people. You have new conduct. You're, you're aliens and strangers. There are people are gonna, who look on your good deeds and slander you. And say that's not good. We see examples of this in our world where our ethic just clashes. We're trying to fight for the right for these unborn babies to be protected under law. And yet we are accused of hating women because we don't, we're removing their right to choose. Their right to choose murder. There's more, um, but we have to know that our ethic, what we stand for, what we think is right, can be turned back around on us to speak of us as evildoers. But then there's something interesting here. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds. So this is taking place with, in front of them. They may see your good deeds. What is a good deed? Well, we've talked about abstaining from passions of the flesh. Is good deeds just like watching a good, you know, a wholesome TV or not engaging in certain immoral practices? What is it? Well, let's just give a couple scriptures here. And Titus 1.14 says that Christ died to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These deeds are visible ways of doing good to others in the name of Jesus. In Titus chapter 2, Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Titus 3.8, the saying is trustworthy, and I want you to do, insist on these things that 
those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Good works. Doing good for others in the name of Christ. Now, one pastor goes all out when he's talking about good works. And here's what he says. Caring for AIDS orphans in Africa, feeding the malnourished, housing the homeless, teaching the illiterate and ignorant, freeing the addicted and fighting crime and visiting the prisoner, befriending the lonely, laboring in the cause of protecting the unborn and relieving the crisis of unexpected pregnancies and a thousand other visible ways of doing good to others in the name of Jesus. Now, that's great, that's good, but sometimes when we do that, and import that into good works, like, that's a little like, that's, how am I going to do that? I'm a mom with four kids, or, you, you know. And so, we also need to realize, like, yes, let's give our whole lives to doing good for Jesus' name, but also not sort of say, like, if our life looks pretty ordinary, we're not doing any good works, okay? But what is the purpose of these good deeds, it comes out here that we have a purpose clause. So that when these people, Gentiles, unbelievers, speak evil against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So they see them and glorify God on the day of visitation. Now, I don't know about you, but when I come to that, I don't know what that means initially. Glorify God on the day of visitation. We have a couple options here that we need to work through. Um, first off, glorify God. That is praising God. Um, extolling God. These are evildoers who now are doing that. So, interesting how this happens. And then what is this day of visitation? That's how we got to get to the bottom of this. Let's look at this closely. So that when they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Two options here. One is that your good deeds might cause them to be convicted and might want to find more about this Jesus whom you're living for, and then believe that and ultimately glorify God. Then we still have to work on what's visitation. Another option is that, based on the, the way the letter's written, these people are speaking to you of, as evildoers, but eventually they're going to come to realize, possibly at the day of judgment, that you were right and they were wrong. And in God judging them, he will be vindicated, you will be vindicated. And so they, in their bowing of the knee of some sorts, they will glorify God. This can be supported in a couple different ways here. First, if you look at verse 15 of chapter 2, for this is the will of God that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. So your good deeds shut their mouths. You could also look at chapter 3, verse 16. You're basically um, giving a defense for the faith with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Wow, their mouths will be sh stopped and they'll be put to shame. This also fits with Philippians chapter 2. Remember, Christ will be exalted and be given the name above all names, not Jesus, but Lord, and every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's everybody, believer or unbeliever, is going to bow the knee and recognize Christ as Lord. Is that what this is teaching? I want to leave the door open for that interpretation, but I think 
it is actually more along the lines of people will see your conduct, how beautiful it is, and God might use that in grace to close their mouths, put them to shame, and they might then trust in this God who has transformed your life. There's one verse that leads me down that direction, and it is in this book. It's in chapter 3, verse 1. Listen to this. 1 Peter 3, 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that if you've, even if some do not obey the word, which I will argue when I would get to there that this is an unbelieving husband, they disobey the word, they disobey the gospel, that they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. So, we've got some steps here. Uh, your conduct closes mouths, silences people. It brings them to shame and can even be used to win them. But how does that fit in with the day of visitation? Because when I first read the day of visitation, where do you go to? You're thinking, that's probably the second coming of Christ. When he finally reveals himself in glory and there's going to be judgment, that's when he's coming. But this is an Old Testament phrase that can be used either for judgment or for blessing. Let me just read to you from prophet Isaiah. What will you do on the day of visitation in the ruin that will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help and where will you leave your wealth? Judgment. On the other hand, Exodus 3, verses 2 through 10, speaks of God visiting His people in mercy through the Exodus. Similarly, Jeremiah prophesied this, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. Mercy. We have an example in the New Testament, usually used positively for blessing. We looked at this text last um, Advent series when we looked at Luke. Zechariah prophesied, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He has visited us and accomplished redemption for His people. Then we have, on the other hand, concerning the destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus prophesies, and He says, they will level you to the ground and your children within you. They will not leave you in one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Context is judgment, and yet the time of visitation is Christ in grace, coming and saying, all you are weary and heavy laden, come to me, and I will give you rest for your souls. They rejected that, and so they will experience uh, the judgment. So, leaning towards 1 Peter, and, and what's said here, you're, you're thinking, okay, seems like somebody could be won over by conduct. Looking at the rest of the New Testament, and even into the Old, it could be both judgment or mercy. Listen to Acts 15, 14, okay? This is surrounding Peter, and Peter tells his story of how Cornelius and the Gentiles have come to faith. And in Acts 15, 14, James is speaking, and he says, Peter has related how God first visited the Gentiles, to take them from a people for his name. So, he describes what took place with Cornelius. Remember, Peter went and preached the gospel to him. He was a Gentile, and the Holy Spirit comes upon him at the hearing of the gospel, and he's saved. He relates that as the visitation of God. So, rather than saying, okay, this is the end times, these people will glorify God at the end, a visitation can be God coming in converting grace to someone based upon them seeing the good works of another coming to faith in Christ. This might be what Jesus is speaking of in Matthew 5.16. 
He said, in the same way, let your light shine be yet for others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, I know that's a lot of work to get to where we're at here, but I want you to realize that your life counts. It is very important. We can muster ourselves up to do evangelism. I know that's even, that's really hard to do, just to be like, all right, I want to go tell people about Christ. But we also need to be realizing that our witness involves our good deeds, our conduct. And God may be pleased to use that in bringing someone to faith in Christ. We have modern, well, we have old examples of that. I'll share one from the 20th century. There was a missionary couple who um, got captured in a Japanese prisoner camp in Philippines. This was World War II. These were American missionaries, Herb and Ruth Klingen, and their young son. They were all prisoners for three years. In his diary, he tells of the the terrible torture, the things that they had to do and that they experienced and what they saw. It was absolutely horrible, the worst of which was this camp commander named Konushi, who was particularly brutal. And this man, um, by God's providence, uh, let the Klingons eventually go. They were released, and in February 1945, when Allied forces liberated the prison camp, okay, so they're set free. Now, years later, the Klingons learned that Konishi, this man who was the groundkeeper, the one in charge, who had done horrible things, before his death, when he was hanged, he said, you know what, I'm a Christian. And he attributes that to the witness of these two missionaries and others in how they approached suffering unjustly. We have modern-day examples of this as well. Rosaria Butterfield, she was a lesbian feminist. And because of the hospitality and kindness of her pastor neighbor who invited her over for dinner and started kind of wrapping her into the family, she was totally broken down. She had wrongly misjudged Christianity, and in God's grace, He saved her. A radical transformation, she attributes, to the witness of these believers. So, we have some excellent, encouraging, pastoral exhortations here. Be on guard for the passions that wage war against your soul. Don't let them destroy you. And yet, in so doing that, also be, live honorably in beautiful, wonderful lives. God might even use that to save those who are rejecting Him. So, does that give you motivation for living a godly life? I always come to passages like this, and I'm saying... If ever I get the feeling like, oh, I can't give in to my passions, I can't give in to my lusts, or, oh, I got to do good deeds, you need to remember where you came from, what He did, took you out of. That's our identity. It says that He called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. You were once not a people, but now you are God's people. Darkness, horrible. I mean, think of the, the things that you've done in your life, the people you've hurt, the dishonor you've brought to God, and now you get to not give in to those terrible passions that bring destruction. You get to do good to others that are beautiful and honorable to where you, you lay your head down at night on a pillow and you have a clear conscience. It's glorious. It's so good. It's so good. What does it all come from? It's God's grace. It pulls you out of that, and then it's God's grace working in you and transforming you so He gets all the glory. Okay? Let's pray to the Lord. Our Father, thank You so much for this passage. Uh, we can very easily be drawn after the enticements of the world as those desires take root in our hearts. 
and they then uh, give birth to sin, which then ends in death. Uh, we're in a battle. Thank you for this reminder. May we be a serious group of Christians that w- rather than having our lusts win the battle, we are fighting together as a community by your grace through prayer and the means which you've given us, your holy word, the Holy Spirit, and the accountability and friendship of other believers. We pray we'd embrace this, we'd take it as a great warning to our souls and run hard after Christ, our glorious Savior, that rather than have desires for sin, we'd have desires for Him and for honoring Him. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.